Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're back continuing our journey with the Matt Helm films. And we have a very special guest to help talk about not the most recent one we've been speaking about, The Wrecking Crew, but the original one, The Silencers. Cam, who do we have joining us? Yes, we are joined by actress Nancy Kovac, who played the deadly assassin Barbara in the 1966 Matt Helm film, The Silencers, but also is known for a lot of her other notable works, such as Jason and the Argonauts, the Batman 66 TV show, Star Trek, a pretty fascinating filmography, as well as a few spy shows sprinkled in there as well. Absolutely. And it's not often a modern day podcast like this gets to speak to a legend of that era, like Nancy, someone who can tell us stories about working with Dean Martin. So I think without further ado, let's get right to it. Cam, roll the interview. And joining us now on the show, the star of films like Jason and the Argonauts, The Silences, TV shows like Get Smart, I Spy, Man from Uncle Batman, Star Trek. The list goes on and on. Miss Nancy Kovac. Hello, Nancy. How are you? Terrific. Wonderful, wonderful. Hope you are. No, the pleasure is ours. Nancy, thank you for coming on the show. I hope the weather in Italy is a damn sight better than how it is now in London. <laughs> it is. It's beautiful. Well, Nancy, the first question we have for everyone who jumps on the show, and I think it's an important question to sort of for our listeners to get an idea of your journey. How did you get started and what sort of interested you about becoming an actor? An actress? I didn't want to become an actress. I wanted to do something in science. But I was, I graduated from the University of Michigan on Friday. And on Saturday, I went to... New York, with the permission of my parents, for a wedding on Sunday of a classmate. And I was to return on Monday to my home in Michigan. And while I was there on Sunday after the wedding, another classmate said, Would you like to do uh, an odd, uh, what was it? I've forgotten the word she used was an audition and I didn't know what she meant because I was not I had no connection to that world and um, I said well what why would I do well you know you might they're seeing a lot of girls and they might you might uh, get a job oh what kind of job well she didn't know all right so what do I do well you go to this address and when I got there, oh, it was a cattle call. That was the word she used. And I didn't know what a cattle call was. And <laughs> I went, and I, it was in a huge auditorium, like a basketball court. And I took a number, and my number was 879. <laughs> and I sat down and waited till 879 came up. And then I went with these hundreds of girls to another end of the hall where I was asked to stand on a six-inch platform in front of people sitting, maybe five people, sitting at a table. And at the table was Jackie Gleason. I don't know if anyone remembers that. Mm -hmm. And I stood... And I was asked to sit down. They were very busy at that table looking over some papers. And never once, not one person at that table looked up. So I, I was asked to leave. And I said, well, why am I asked to leave? Nobody looked at me or talked to me. Well, that was a... Uh... So I thought, well, this is stupid. I've invested my time up to 879. So I went into a bathroom, and I put a, I had a ribbon with me, I don't know why, and I tied my hair in a ponytail, and I had a sweater because it may have been chilly, so I put the sweater over my shoulders, and I went back to get a number, and the number was 1,304. <laughs> So I took the number and I sat down I went and I was called up again and I stood on the platform and they asked me to turn around and talk to me for one second and said, thank you, stay. 
So I sat down again and waited for about 40 minutes. And then a hundred of us out of those, that thousand and whatever it was, were asked to stand in a circle in the auditorium while all the other girls were dismissed. So I stood in the line and his uh, dancer, uh, head of his dance team, came by and tapped people on the shoulder and said, thank you, stay, thank you, stay, 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 thank you, stay, stay, stay. And he tapped me on the shoulder and said, thank you. Wow. So I stood out of the line and the photographer said, well, that doesn't sound right. And I smiled at him and I walked around and I got in the other side of the line. And when she came to me, she tapped me and said, stay. And 10 of us were chosen out of that 1,500 people. These 10 people were put on camera, and I was chosen. And I don't know um, who, I can't tell you the names of the other people at the moment, but those nine other people out of those 10 people knew Jackie Gleason intimately. They partied with him. They ate with him. They knew him for years. I was the only person out of that 1,500 people on this so-called cattle call. I found that quite astonishing that didn't know Jackie Gleason. And it really rocked me. At any rate, I got the job. It was far from what I expected to do in life. I hadn't a clue what I was doing. And I was one of the glee girls that opened the show on television. And they were all dancers. Now, I couldn't dance, but I could count. (laughs) And they all said to me, she has a university education. Look at her count. You know, like 52, 3, 2, 4, so on and so forth. And that's how that all started. I didn't choose to be an actress. It was uh, your pure persistence that got you there. How about expectation? Mm. I like that. I like that. Expectation. And what's fascinating to me about that is that I just simply listened I was, and I'm still listening. I'm a thousand years old now, and I am still listening. And I hear strong indications of where to go and what to do and what to accomplish, etc. And I often not only contradict, argue with, if not struggle with, um, those, I say commandments, because they're very forceful and very certain so i should be smart enough now just to follow them and not and not and not argue you know well they, they saw you pretty well too long in that an answer no but all my no. answers are not that long <laughs> hey it's it's our show you can say as much as you want on it it's not a problem at all um i, I suppose then bouncing off of that though you, you've got this you're working with jackie gleason sort of doing the intros for the show where did the acting come along when did the first sort of you got your first starring role or 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 part role on a tv show or a film when did that transition happen and how did that happen at that time in new york while doing the gleason show which of course isn't an not isn't a 40 hour week job there's a lot of free time and I learned to, uh, girls would say well go to this man he's an agent what's an agent Well, they get you jobs. Well, I have a job. Yes, but you can get other jobs. I was absolutely so naive. I entered university at 15. So when I got out, I had just turned, was going into 19. I knew nothing. It took me year, it took me two years to understand what an agent really meant. You have to want to be in that business and know what an agent is. I didn't know what an agent was. 
I thereafter was so busy working every hour of the day, and they would say, well, you should get an agent. They were right, of course, meaning with direction. And and I said, well, what will he, well he'll get you work. I, but I'm working nonstop. There's not another hour in the day that an agent could get me another job. And they must have thought I was daft because they were thinking of, higher quality jobs or whatever. But I did two shows, two television shows at one time. May I just suggest to consider that at that time, women didn't have jobs in the country. Yeah. The reason I even was interested in pursuing or continue is because it was the only job that I could think of outside of a secretary in which they paid you anything. Do you understand what I mean? You can't because you're a man and that never happened in your or your generation's male history. No. It was just, it was shocking. And so I thought, well, this would be wonderful if I could do this job in my life because it pays more than a secretary. You can see the insipid thinking, the young girl, unsophisticated thinking in this. At any rate, this is one of those directional um, imperatives that I questioned, but it was very strong, and I followed it. That's all. And I wouldn't be where I am right this minute, sitting in this Tuscan villa overlooking the valley with everything blooming. I have peaches on my tree, little baby peaches, with this glorious sky if I did not attend that cattle call. Right. You can't argue with the results. And. <laughs> no. I'm curious, you know, when you, you know, you say it up front, like you weren't particularly familiar with acting and you had to learn, was there a moment or a role where you felt like, I'm becoming confident in this, I have faith in my abilities? Well, I used to what I, I used to make what I thought was a joke. I can't remember which, Natalie, Natalie, was there Natalie Woods? And I used to say, she brushes her teeth in the morning, so do I. Hmm. I like Natalie Woods. I just didn't think she was a phenomenal actress, so I thought if I could do the same as she did, she must have been doing something very prominent at that time, then what is the problem? To me, it was extremely simplistic. And about acting, once you get there and you do it, and you really listen to your actor, really listen to the person opposite you, Things happen inside you. It's very exciting. I was once in a role where a man, a producer, a director, took me aside and explained to me, you see, Nancy, you may not know, but in the war, they didn't know if they'd be alive the next morning. They didn't know. And so the person you met tonight, you may never see again in your whole life. You may never see anyone in your whole life again. And so you see, Nancy, it changes your perspective. Something that you might think about this person in a normal, non-warlike environment uh, doesn't apply here. You're a different person here. And I thought, oh, my God. I was so grateful for that. It completely changed me. And I remember, I don't drink. I've never had a drink in my life. I hated going to bars and all of that. I wanted to go to a bar before I got home. I didn't do that. But I wanted to go to sit, sit and think about my other character in this part about the war and the next morning and the bombing in London, took place in London. I didn't, I went home. But that really changed my whole, that was an impetus that I could use and apply 
in many areas. Hmm. Well, I think if we're going to jump into one of the films we were going to talk about, which is The Silencers, the Matt Helm spy film that you starred off with uh, Dean Martin, uh, quite into the, sort of the mid '60s. There, do you have any recollection of of that role? Yes, I do. A very kind of nothing role, I thought. Yeah, it, it, I mean, you get a scene where you're trying to uh, seduce Dean Martin's Matt Helm, and then you're shot in the back by Dalia Lavi uh, as a as a fellow agent. But you're both trying to take them out, basically. You're both trying to kill Dean Martin in your own special way. Um, but you know, going back to that role, do you remember auditioning for it? How that part came to you at all? How it came to me? Mm-hmm. Um, yes, it's specific. I hate to disappoint you, but it came to me through the William Morris Agency the agency to which I was signed. But I loved Dean Martin. I think everybody loved Dean Martin. And when I first came to Los Angeles with tears in my eyes because I hated leaving New York, I was invited by Jeannie Martin, Dean's wife, to their home for dinners. And there were tons of young girls there. And Jeannie Martin thought, well, rather than them go out and find young, attractive girls, I'll just bring them home and they'll always be home. For a young girl from Michigan, this was shocking. Just shocking to me. It was a whole new way of thinking. I didn't understand it. And thereafter, I saw him throughout the industry here, there, and Jeannie, of course, as well. And so he was like a a buddy somehow. Um, I got, almost grew up with him, kind of, in the business. It was nothing. It was just walk on and walk off. Uh, so, Well, actually, it was a very short scene. You're, you're quite right. But at least you had that foundation with him leading into it. What was it like to sort of finally get to work with him on screen in that sense? Um, you know, you know people always ask that, and I don't know what other people who work in the business say. They're probably more facile than I. It was very comfortable, let me say that. <laughs> when you're working, you're working. And you have to be, you are really, I know, you know, every actor on a set that I've known in every case and every days for over a decade is very cool and loose. Trust me, they are not cool and loose. They have lines going on in their heads. They have marks on the floor in their mind where they had to be last time. They know which side is their right side and wrong side. They they know every, and they are working in their mind. And nobody is cool and not paying attention. Everybody is paying attention. And so we paid attention. We got the job done. And we went home. There was a, there was, I know it would be nice if I could say there was great camaraderie. Well, nobody was sitting around talking to each other and making jokes. We were all working. If we sat down to wait for a shot to be set up, we didn't because there was no shot to be set up. It was already set up. We walked on, we did it, and we got off. I'm sorry to be disappointing. I'm sorry. (laughs) No, that's quite all right. I mean, so, I mean, this movie directed by Phil Carlson, when you're shooting the movie, is he very, like, a quick shooter? Like, did it, like, was the your material shot very quickly in that day? It was. You know, I have a picture of, uh, of, of, uh of us in holding each other in our arms and he is behind us and he's got his hands on his hips and he's screaming at somebody off stage. (laughs) I love that picture because if he walked in this room, I wouldn't recognize him today, nor he, I probably, but he was screaming at something that was disturbing to him, but it was a very quick shot. And were you surprised at the success of the movie? Because it was quite a big hit in its day. Um, I didn't realize it was a big hit. Oh, okay. It was? It was a reasonably big hit. I mean, it spawned three sequels, so it did pretty well. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that at all. Um, 
Well, I'm certainly surprised now. (laughs) (laughs) Awfully glad you called and all of that to tell me that. So I can cross out my question about asking you if you watch the sequels. (laughs) Yes. Everybody loved Dean. Dean was so loose, supposedly, but everybody loved him. Why wouldn't someone run and see him in the movie? It, it was really like Dean's Mar- Dean Martin's moment at that time as well, because the TV show came out at the same time. So you had the Matt Helm films and Dean Martin show, um, and so he he was he was America's favorite at that point. I, I always got the impression. Yes, um, but, but you mentioned that connection to him. Uh, aside from filming the silences, which, as you said, was a very brief experience in your in your filmography, do you have any other memories of just like of Dean of, of being around him and being in his company during your period working in Hollywood? Yes, he was very loose, and um, my mother always said, "Nancy, listen to this man. He always sings after the beat." She used to tell me that in Michigan. I don't, I think I always have thought he was one of the best singers. He had the greatest understanding of of the musicality of music of anyone. And I know Frank is terrific, but I would have chosen him for his singing over Frank any time. I thought he was that that special and um, I used to see him well I don't know you know once you're there and people are acting people are working together you see them constantly you see them here there and bump into them and we just all knew each other like um, with camaraderie the other day I saw a TikTok in which um, it was a roast by, um, oh my gosh, my good friend whose name I've forgotten, um, was roasting people. And there was um, a great television host, Sammy Davis Jr., Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Ronald Reagan, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And it was such a joy to see them all because that was a certain time. You can feel it in your stomach almost, feeling that time. And maybe that time is existing now, and I certainly don't need it, feel it. I certainly don't know it and can't feel it. Um, so I'm not saying that it's not existing now. But those people were distinct in those times. And I don't see strong distinctions in films today of personalities. Do you? No. And I think there's been so much talked and written about how kind of the era of the movie star no longer exists where it was those strong personalities. It's more like the intellectual property or the franchise over, you know, personality. Yes, I'm not saying it's bad or worse or better or whatever. I'm just saying that it's different, quite different, mm. strongly different, as are our films, are they not? Uh, yes, I would say so, yes. I I just want to add, I think Cam might have a follow-up question, but Nancy, you've, you've blown me away knowing that you're on TikTok. Uh, I'm not alone in there, which is great. Oh, because you do too? Yeah, That's I'm because TikTok, great yeah. minds think alike, you know that. I, I do now. I love TikTok. TikTok has t- changed my life. I don't think anything else could change my life like TikTok. I I have been introduced to areas that I was per not, per, I was not permitted to to enter when I was a young girl. When I my mother was from Boston. And my mother found herself in Michigan, God forbid. I could never turn on two two beats of a country song my entire life. My entire life, I couldn't do that. I had to turn it off. I was permitted not to. I was not permitted to listen to them, to sing to them. I was not permitted to listen to 
them talk with accents, et cetera, et cetera. And it is such a joy for me now, I cannot tell you. I just love it. I love it. They're not going to take it away from us, are they? I hope not. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, you bring up music is actually a good segue for me. I wanted to jump over to another movie you made, um, Jason and the Argonauts, uh -huh. which I was rewatching again last night. And because you had nothing to do, Cam. <laughs> Well, I mean, <laughs> fair, but <laughs> but I like to be prepared every time. I'd seen it many times in the past, but one thing that really interested me about this movie is the dance sequence in this movie that you have, and it's notable. You mentioned, you know, just a few minutes ago that when you got the job with ja uh, Jackie Gleason, you didn't really know how to dance very well. So I'm curious about choreographing that really iconic moment in Jason and the Argonauts. There was no dance instructor. There was no choreography. And they just sent me from Palinuro, which is a little uh, a little village on the coast of the, of the Shin of Italy, beneath Pestum, beneath Rome. And that's where we shot that film. So when they had a break from me on the ship, they sent me up there to do this. I went alone. <laughs> they told me to dance. I said, I don't know how to dance. Just do something. So that was my just doing something. I'm not terribly impressed with that, you know. But everybody mentions that. Why aren't you impressed with it? Well, it's kind of... I must have high standards because I don't think that's a very impressive. I'm not terribly impressed with that. I'm a little embarrassed by it because I do not know how to dance and I just moved. And that's all. Well, when I watch it, you know, obviously like the, the makeup and the costuming, of course, is very powerful. But like there's something like otherworldly about it. And maybe the fact it doesn't feel like a standard choreographed dance routine of that era, it makes it feel like kind of another world that they're visiting. That's a fascinating remark. And I'm sure that you're really right on because I was very alone and didn't know what to do. And I was saying, you know, I have this buddy called God and I said, God, what am I supposed to do here? What is this person, and what is she doing, and what do people who are in this position do? I had not a clue. So I was really listening for anything that could be added to this that might be of interest. That's really a simplistic answer to you, isn't it? That's how simplistic it was, and maybe how lost I was. I don't know. But thank you. <laughs> oh, no, no. I mean, in a way, it's making, you know, lemonade out of lemons, right? Like you had a situation that maybe wasn't the optimal approach to work, yes. but the results sort of have an odd energy that I think still works. Yes, thank you very much. They should have sent with that person who happened to be me, some simple person who could choreograph something, but they didn't want to spend the money, I guess. And also, think about this. It's because of that film that I'm sitting where I'm sitting right now, looking over this gorgeous landscape, because I so loved Italy from that time. And I remember the wife of the producer of that film said, Nancy, I'm going this weekend. Would you like to go? Go where? To, Flo to Florence? Well, what's in Florence? Well, it's one of the cultural of the world of the all kind and the museum and the and I said, well, maybe a little later, because I didn't know about Florence. I was so young, um, and and here I am in Florence, thanks to Jason and the Argonauts. Now, how long did it take you to kind of? visiting there the first time and then circling back to be there now like did you visit often over the years florence you mean yeah yeah i've come for over 50 years because my husband is connected with the theater the orchestral opera here and 
Um, so I've come every year for 54 years. 54 years we've been married. Wow. And I would love to know just in terms of the character of Medea in um, Jason the Argonauts about the efforts just you working with the costume and makeup team to achieve the look of that character because it's very striking in the film. Um, what is the look of that character to you? Well, it depends, I guess, on the scene, but I mean, it has that kind of like, it almost feels like comic book um, Greek mythology. I where see, it's yes. Sort of thing, one image <laughs> tells you so much. Yes. Well, I did my own makeup for that, that I wish I hadn't. Um, and um, I'm really apologetic to be simplistic to you. No, no. But that was a job, Kyle, where you get up, put on your makeup, go down at 5 o'clock because the sun, you had to be there when the sun was up on the ship. And um, I thought, thought that she was rather a contemporary-looking girl, contemporary for the time. Mm. You know, I look at all the effects in the film, and I have to imagine that so much thought was being put into the technicalities of the production. Did it feel like as an actor that you didn't necessarily get the best working environment in terms of like performance the way you might with some other roles? Exactly. Mm. Yes, that was a very, you know, we Americans didn't know about Harryhausen. And um, so this was a learning experience for us. And I know that people just love that film. I went, I left Italy uh, last year in the fall or something and went to one of those signing conventions in the eastern part of the United States. And I just can't tell you how people are, I, I, I have no way to describe to you the shock I have at the thousands of people who are just crazy for that film and have histories and stories and how many times they've seen it, et cetera, et cetera. So that evening they were showing that film. So I sneaked out of my room and I went to see the film because I only saw it once in my life. Mm. I could hardly sit through the film. I don't know what people are talking about. I don't know... I thought it was because of the time that was what was available. But they're still talking about it, and there's much more available now. So my thinking is that they should be involved in more advanced developments, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but they're not. They're still in love with that film. And I'm so happy for them. I really mean that because they're so genuine, <laughs> truly genuine in their reaction to it. I think it's just like the very like kind of innocent high spiritedness of it. Like it has not a drop of cynicism in the whole movie. So I think people really feel the escape of it in a way that often with like say blockbuster films, you just don't quite get. Uh-huh. Well, that's an interesting remark and a very nice remark as well. And it's also interesting that you bring up conventions, Nancy, because uh, Cam and I met many moons ago at a Star Trek convention, which is a TV show you were also involved in. I do believe uh, Cam has bumped into you once at a convention in the past. I, I do have an autograph photo, yes. I see. Where was that in the in, in the United States? Obviously, yeah, it was in the Las Vegas Creation Star Trek convention from probably. Uh huh. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, maybe four years ago, something like that. Mm hmm. Yes. Well, that's a. It, it's just interesting to sort of bring that sort of topic up of, of Star Trek, really, because it is how Cam and I connected. Um, any uh, just sort of your thoughts and memories of working on Star Trek? Is it one of those roles that people bring up to you, much like Jason and the Argonauts? Non nonstop. Do you know that every day I get maybe fifteen Star Trek pictures to autograph? 
every day, wherever I am. Fifteen. It is the uh, most revered work, and they love that character. I didn't know when I made that show. When you get off this call, you're going to think she's really stupid. She must have she yeah. must have slept walked through the whole her whole life. I didn't have time. I was so busy working in Los Angeles. I never got to see Star Trek. I may have seen half a show one day in my life, and then I worked on a show. But when I did that that um, character, I got that script, and I thought, well, when I get on stage, they'll explain. When I get to the set, they'll explain. No one explained anything to me. And I couldn't understand why this woman had a husband, and then she was trying to make the star of this show do something else. Why would she have a husband and be doing that? I, I tell you that was in my mind nonstop. Two years later, someone explained to me that that character was from a certain planet and that she was there to save her people by diverting uh, Captain Kirk to not attack her people. Had somebody told me that, I may have played that slightly differently, but probably not much more differently. I enjoyed doing it because I got to speak loudly. I got to speak strongly <laughs> and almost uh, comic-like, uh, in your words. Uh, and I enjoyed that. It was fun. And was it fun to play someone who was kind of an antagonist or had a little bit of a villainous streak as well? Kind of. I didn't understand her. I didn't understand why she was doing that. Uh, I, I didn't understand anything. So you wonder how I ever got through all of that. <laughs> well, uh, you, you sold it for me. I'm still bowled over that 15 people send you letters about Star Trek every day. I think that's a really touching a part of the Trek fandom. Is it, it? We love everyone. I think it is because those people should all be doing something else at this moment. In my view, if people grow, they should be... I'm not doing something from 40 years ago in my life. Are you doing something from 40 years ago? I bet not. And uh, But they are, and they come from all over the world. They come from Japan, New Zealand, Australia, China. I got the sweetest letter from a boy in China the other day. Germany, England, everywhere, and the United States. And I know that they're genuine because they write with their hearts. And I sign them and send them back. Had the people, had the people since that who write that show, they probably would have brought that character back. You're, you're probably right there. Unfortunately, it was a bit of a mess behind the scenes for most of the years it was on the screen. I think if they had a bit more forethought, you would have seen people like you come back for another episode. Absolutely. Yeah. We interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Attention, spy hards, die hards, independent podcasting. Much like the spy game requires considerable resources, whether it's research, equipment, hosting, or of course constructing a hidden moon base, we're putting out the call for your support. That's right, the Spy Hearts Patreon is the home to our ever-growing lineup of Agents in the Field episodes where we decode non-spy films from your favorite spy actors, and The Debrief, where we activate our billion-dollar brains and predict how the spy movie news of today will shape tomorrow. Cam, what have we got in our crosshairs this month? Scott, June is coming to an end, so it's time to launch the latest episode of The Debrief, where we're going to look at news related to James Bond, Mission Impossible, Secret Invasion, and who knows what else. So accept your mission and hop in the hell mobile today at patreon.com slash spyhards. But before Spectre agents intercept this broadcast, let's get back to the spy jinx. Well, I, I also want to tackle on a couple of other TV shows because we do talk about spy movies here, but you were on quite a few spy TV shows. Now, I know that it all happened in a very short amount of time, but I mean, shows like Get Smart, you were on, I Spy, you were on, Man From U.N.C.L.E., you were on twice. <laughs> that was 
so funny. Do you remember any of these? It's, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. You've you've done so much spy work, but it, it's all just sort of blended in. Yes, but it's it's nothing that I did. It's what existed that we booked. Do you well, know I, the I, difference? Yeah, absolutely. I, I I totally get where you're coming from. I I wanted to ask a couple of quick questions as I slowly wrap us up here, but I know Cam wanted to mention something about Batman. Yeah. Um. So you know, you mentioned when you did Star Trek, you didn't because Tom likes Batman, right? Is that it? I do. Well, I do. Cam is wearing a Batman shirt as we speak. Funnily enough. Yes. That is also true. Uh, I did not actually plan that, so just it's coincidence. But um, so the original Batman show was like a big deal for me when I was growing up. I'm sure you've heard this a billion times. But like one of the characters that was a huge icon for me was Cesar Romero's Joker. Yeah. And I would love to know, you know, that's you appeared in his first appearance on that show, just working with Cesar Romero and kind of seeing this character brought to the light for the first time. Cam, you're very funny. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you that I got up at 3.45 every morning. I wash my hair, put it in curlers because I was asked to do that. I then drank some Jello in milk. That was my breakfast. Oh. I got in the car at 5 o'clock. I was in my seat across the valley at 6 o'clock. When I got out of there at 7 o'clock, I came home. I ate some hot thing from some deli. I came home and learned my script until 10 o'clock at night, fell asleep by 10.30 and was up at 3.45 every month. I worked every day of the week. There was no way I could watch television. There was no way I could have dinner with you. There was no way I could... Sh chat on the telephone there was no way i could do anything so i didn't know about this show but i went in and i knew mm -hmm. on the set that there was great excitement over this over over this character and i was so happy to be with him i was so grateful to be alive and be working and be on the set and that's what I remember. It was a joy to work with him, but I knew nothing of the character in the in the show mm -hmm. because I had no background, not able to have seen it. Where would I see it? True, yeah, yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. You can't yeah. see it at 11 o'clock at night between 11 and 3.45. You didn't Maybe have a VCR to tape weekends, it. I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, okay, well, how, how about this, Nancy? I've got a couple of quick questions before we let you go, okay? I The first one is kind of connected to you going to conventions. And I mentioned, you know, Star Trek conventions, but you mentioned some other ones with Jason and the Argonauts. What is it about sort of interacting with the fans that keeps you coming back to these conventions? What do you sort of enjoy about that interaction? Well, where did I go? I think it was, maybe it was Vegas. Hmm. First of all, I've never done these. I've been asked to do them. I had no idea what they were talking about. Finally, because the man is from Michigan, and he was so genuine, so sincere, I said, all right, and I went to the one in Los Angeles. I had no idea that they paid you. When he paid me at night, I was blown away. I said, no, I can't take that. What is that? I just signed the pictures. What are you doing? Oh, no, we pay every... I was in total shock about that. So then I went to the next one. And anyway, I carry around a mantra with me, and it is, where thy children are, I love to be. Because once I was uh, asked to do a tour of the United States to open some movie. And I thought I was going to die. I just thought I was going to die. I'm a very, you may not be able to see this, but I'm an extremely strong person. I can do anything. There's nothing I can't do. Don't, I don't whine. I don't cry. There's no, just get me to, I'm, but I hated going on this tour because I didn't want to meet thousands of people every night hmm. in every state, in every city, all across the country. I just couldn't do it. And that sentence was given to me 
where thine own children are, I love to be. So I love every one of those people who comes to that desk. So the first person came and I said, good morning, how are you? Welcome, welcome, welcome. Where are you from? He said, Wales. I said, are you saying Wales? Are you saying the Wales that I think Wales is? And he said, yes. I said, you came from, that's where you were born. Well, yes. But I said, where did you come from? He said, Wales. I said, you flew from Wales here to this guy? Yes. Now, you just think <laughs> that you... You're in England, so that's nothing to you. But from Wales to Las Vegas, that is exotic. I mean, that is really exotic. I was just blown away from that. I said, there's something I've got to understand about these people that I obviously do not understand. And so I try to understand where each one is figuratively coming from thereafter. And I really love every one of them because I think they're amazing. I don't think I would ever go to one of those conventions. You're the star. Why would you? If I weren't, I wouldn't go to uh. one of those conventions. I don't believe. I mean, I just don't understand it. I have a lot of things I don't understand in life. And I'm so grateful to them all. I, and I, the, where was it? Was it Vegas? No, I don't know where it was. It might have been the like the Hollywood show. I saw a lot of that Nona character walking mm. around in that cut-up orange bath mat with a bare midriff and <laughs> hanging pants and a wig on. I mean, she was walking around like that. And she had her boyfriend dressed up like Nona's husband. I, I mean, it's an unreal world, really. I, 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 that that about sums up the Las Vegas uh, Star Trek convention experience. I, I think if I was going to give you my like two cents as to why I think it's such an important thing for some people, myself included, is you know you go to the cinema. Usually, you're surrounded by people that love film, but you don't get to talk to them afterwards. You go to a Star Trek convention or a film convention, any sort of convention in that sense. You're in a room with hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who all care about exactly the same thing. You are in a room full of love for the thing that you also love. It's one of the most positive and reaffirming things I think I've ever done. Yes, that's true. That's true. Well, I, I suppose I did say we had a couple of quick questions, so I'll, I'll fire off my second to last one to you. And this is uh, a question I like to ask everyone who comes on the show. Is there something that you worked on that obviously we haven't mentioned, I would assume, that you are really proud of your work as an actress that maybe didn't get the attention it deserves or isn't mentioned to you as much as other things that you would like to point out? I'm so sorry to disappoint you, and I'm sorry to disappoint myself more. I always beg them that I wanted to do serious work. And because I may have brought them a lot of money, I don't know. I worked every day of the week for every year. Do you know what that is? I never had a vacation. I just worked nonstop, Monday through Friday, blah, blah, blah. Hmm. And I was never given the chance. For an, I would have liked to have been Sally Fields in, uh, I was thinking of her last night, that's why I bring it up, in that movie where she, she's standing on a table, uh, pr proactive for, what was it, unions, I guess, or something or other. Norma Ray? I don't know, was that it? That, I have no idea what it was. I would have loved to have done that, because I understand that. I wanted to do serious Thing, and no one would give me a serious role. You can see the way in which I'm cast. It's always this kind of glamorous, whatever, movie starry kind of um, sale. It was a sale of that kind of character or look or punch up in the film. It's a, someone you hire to punch up the film with that kind of look. And and I was very grateful for every job that I had, but I never was able to perform in anything that made me proud, 
if you know what I mean. Or, if I may say, don't think this is self-aggrandizement. I'm just trying to describe of which I was capable. capable. I felt I was capable of so much more an expansiveness, an understanding of depth, the profundity um, that I was never able, never had a, a character in which to display. I'm going to I, cry. <laughs> well, don't, don't do that on our account. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, when I look at your work, you're bouncing between comedy and drama very seamlessly, so it's very... There's no drama. I never did anything dramatic. Name one thing that was a drama. Nothing. Well, I guess when I say drama, I mean more so in the sense of, like, Star Trek would be considered, like, a dramatic role versus, say, like, the comedy stuff, like, Get Smart or Batman. I mean, in that sense. Uh, but you can't seriously sit on the telephone and say that Star Trek was... Serious. I think that depends who you ask, Nancy. I have to say, acting. I mean, it really depends. Yeah. I don't. I don't. I mean, I. I can't. I'm not going to come down either way on it myself. But I think there's a lot of people that would say it's. It's very straight acting. It's uh, very serious topics that they are discussing on that show. So I'll, I'll leave that to the viewers of Star Trek to decide. I think that's really that's uh, that's for them. But I, I, my last question for you, Nancy, uh, and this one is asked to literally every guest we've ever had on the show. I'm putting you in the hot seat now. Nancy Kovac, what is your favorite spy movie of all time? Spy movie? Mm -hmm. Any spy movie you can think of that you enjoyed. That must be a category that you really love, is it? It's what we talk about every week. It's what we research. It's what we, we, we write about online. It's, uh, it's our specialty, I suppose. I see. I'm so sorry. I can't answer that question. I don't have a favorite. If you ask me of the favorites of the films that I've made, I can't give you a favorite because they're all so different. And I loved, I genuinely loved every one of them. Grateful on my knees for every one of them. And it gave me a wonderful life. But when you said earlier that I was in multiple spy TV um, shows. shows that was a shock to me I don't I don't you're you're correct they were about spies but I wasn't aware of that at all certainly not to count them as you have maybe that was an ilk of that time well it it really was it was a it was a reaction to James Bond which was really the big thing in the 60s so you had all these spy tv shows sort of spring out of nowhere yes you're probably correct and that was a probably a wonderful um vehicle as a as a profession in which to get the audience out of itself because they don't sit around in their dining tables talking about spies. So it was a way to lift them out of their normal, maybe mundane lives. I don't know. Well, it allowed them to be sort of transported around the world, especially in the 60s. There was a lot of travelogue stuff. You know, you'd get to see Tuscany in a spy film because they would travel there and then they would travel to somewhere else. Very exotic, like the Bahamas. And you'd see all these things. You're right. Well, I, I understand you can't pick one as a favorite. I'd probably struggle too. I'll, I'll, I'll default to The Silences because that was the spy film you worked on as your favorite spy film, which is absolutely fine. Nancy, I want to thank you for taking the time uh, from your lovely busy day to, in your very gorgeous place where you are right now to talk to us. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, I, I didn't think I'd be t talking to you, uh, Nancy Kovac, in my entire life, so I'm glad I've had the opportunity to speak about spy movies and everything beyond with you. Yes, I thank you. It was a joy talking with you. And I'm sorry if I'm disappointing to you in my, my personal feelings on the set, et cetera, et cetera. But I loved my industry. I still kind of love it. And um, I'm deeply, deeply grateful. And I love chatting with you. Thank you. I wish you well. It's been a pleasure for us as well. And no, like we will never uh, not 
be excited about honesty in interviews. So just you saying that like some of these experiences were so trying in terms of the work amount and all that, that's honest. And so, no, thank you so much for being so candid with your answers. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Big hug. Bye. There you go, folks. That was our chat with Nancy Kovac. I want to thank Nancy for taking the time to speak with us and thank friend of the show, Scott Ray, for helping put it all together. Cam, what did you think of that one? I really enjoyed this one, Scott. Um, It was great to have someone on who's just so candid about their experiences in Hollywood. Obviously, for Nancy, she retired in the mid-70s from Hollywood, Mm -hmm. so it doesn't have any films or TV post that period. But her ability to kind of remember the stories or at least the personalities of the people she was working with at the time and to be very like frank and honest about some of the experiences she had and just like, you know, so often you have people on who are like, I don't remember that show. She's explaining why I worked literally from 345 until 11 at night every night. Please, I'm sorry. It's a bit of a blur from 60 years ago, but I appreciated like how candid she was in her responses to these questions. Absolutely. And if you're listening to this and sort of hearing her stories and thinking, oh, why wouldn't why wouldn't she remember these things? It was it was that episode of Star Trek. It was a private little war. I mean, you know, you talk about the silences, for instance, and we will talk about that in a little bit more in just a second. But her one scene is is all of two minutes in the film. Mm-hmm. And I, I can imagine that was shot in a day, maybe two. Now, if you could tell me what you were doing 60 years ago on two random days of the year, I would probably applaud you. And on top of that, look up her IMDb profile and just see how many credits she had. Like her year of 1966 alone was insane. Like she was working constantly, as she said, but you know, it's just endless movies and TV. And it was like quite a long period like that. So I can completely sympathize and understand why, you know, a uh, hour long episode of Star Trek is a little bit lost in the mist. Absolutely so. But I think it, let's talk about old Dino. And Matt Helm is what we're here celebrating this week with our review of The Wrecking Crew that came out a few days ago. It's fascinating to hear that Nancy actually was connected to Dean before she ever got the role and was sort of family friends with with Dean and his wife. Uh, I think that sort of connection is really just nice to know that she had that and that sort of support system going into this film. I mean, not that she, as you say, bounced from one to the other, but, you know, getting to work with your friends is a very important thing. And often when we talk to people their experience with an actor is really just tied to the set. Mm -hmm. So they can tell you, okay, you know, this is basically how they're hitting their marks. This is kind of like the brief conversations we had before we shot our scene. That's about all I got. Whereas like Nancy was really able to give us a sense of kind of Dean Martin and sort of the personal life and the personality and the professionalism he brought to the set, which is interesting in that like, in terms of her memories, it was more tied to him as an individual and her experiences with him kind of outside of work versus actually being on set of the silencers. Well, there was an, an interesting nugget that she did kind of drop, which was about the deliberate nature of Dean. Mm-hmm. You know, how people think that this is just this sort of wacky off the cuff persona that he has, which I think was sort of perfected by the, the Dean Martin show, but it was part of his lounge act as well. But it was a, an act. It was something he put on, and he was very good at it. And, and you know, we've sort of chronicled this over our reviews of the Matt Helm films. It's definitely a, a something that he is exceedingly good at portraying. But as Nancy was sort of alluding to, it's something that it is something he worked on and you know took a lot of time to perfect because it, he was someone who had marks that he hit, and he was a professional to the last. And that is definitely something that we have stumbled across a lot in our research for all of these Matt Helms, as well as actually when we did um, Rio Bravo for the Patreon, which is that like Dean Martin had this reputation, as you said, for being kind of the the boozy guy who's just all charm and kind of stumbles onto the set. But like the man's work ethic was unbelievable, frankly, as um, committed as Nancy's was during the 60s period. Well, because he was shooting the, the TV show alongside the Matt Helm films, and that was a full-time job in itself. It was a, a weekly show, variety show, for the bits I've seen anyway. But, you know, that had to be written, that had to be, like, rehearsed, all these sorts of things, and it, it's a it's a full-time job. And I, I was just glad to hear that Nancy had a good time on the set from what she could remember. She was working with her friend. Um, I mean, I, I was going to ask like a really nerdy question about like how long did they make you lay on the floor as a dead person after your shot? Because she's in a lot of like foreground scenes and the background scenes after she's been shot. But I don't think she would remember. She probably had a nap. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And I mean, we did get a funny little anecdote, though, about director Phil Carlson, 
yeah being in the photograph yelling in the background i thought that was fun i i don't think i can i haven't found that one just yet online i'll see if i can track it down see if it's out there somewhere i'll, I'll put it up on our socials if i do find it and it's actually uh, fascinating i was listening to you asking uh nancy questions about jason and the argonauts and i and she mentioned the the dance scene mm-hmm. that you were you brought up actually and how she basically choreographed it herself Mm -hmm. and it it reminded me a lot of a very modern story with uh, jenna ortega on the wednesday show on netflix where it's become mildly famous for a dance routine that she has on that show that she actually choreographed herself as well um just a nice bit of symmetry there in hollywood yeah and it's interesting you know when i was watching jason the argonauts last night it's a movie that just feels so different than anything else Mm-hmm. And part of it is the Harryhausen stop motion effects, which still are incredible to watch and the sequences he puts together. But like everything about the entire movie has such an interesting energy. And she talks about how that dance scene was basically just her basically being fed to the wolves in a way, you know, basically like go do this dance on screen with this elaborate makeup. Uh, we'll get something. But I do think like it holds up as like this very like striking visual and just the energy of that scene really does kind of like exist almost by itself. When you watch the movie, you're kind of like transfixed watching it. It's so odd and kind of eerie. And it does feel that kind of otherworldly vibe that say like someone like Jason traveling to these foreign, far off lands would experience seeing this kind of dance that he would not be familiar with. Well, I was going to uh, it's probably a good time to ask because I haven't seen Jason and the Argonauts. But did it remind you at all of Greta Garbo's sort of Mata Hari dance with it being quite exotic and, and foreign, which is how that's really portrayed on the screen as well? No, it, it feels so much bigger than life. Right. Okay. Um, it, it's very otherworldly. Sure. Okay. Um, but it's, it's interesting that though, and I, I suppose sort of mildly spinning off of Jason and the Argonaut, so that we can definitely talk about that some more as well, is I had expected to hear from Nancy that the 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 film or the project that she was most often referenced was Jason the Argonauts. It's her top credit on IMDb. It's like I think it's her biggest billing in terms of like box office receipts and things like that. She is like a third build in an Elvis film that I watched in preparation for this too. But it's actually Star Trek, which really blew me away. I kind of understand like the cultural cachet of Star Trek has just kept going and going and going. Whereas like Jason, the Argonauts has its fans, but it's probably a smaller segment of the population than the Star Trek people, especially anyone who grew up watching TNG probably tracked down the original series at a certain point and newcomers to the franchise. You know, there's always that kind of like canon element of Star Trek that kind of requires, or at least pushes people gently to, check out all the stories of the past as well. Mm-hmm. So I I can understand why Star Trek endures for her. I, I think it's notable, though, you know, she says, like, she just doesn't understand people's connection to that material or to Jason and the Argonauts, for that matter. And I don't know that a lot of people go to conventions very much, but, like, it's something you run into time and time again. You know, I remember Brent Spiner talking about Star Trek The Next Generation. He was working constantly. He didn't have time to sit and watch or probably did not even want to watch his performances when they're airing. It was like, okay, on to the next performance. I have another episode to film. Mm -hmm. And so it's like the people watching are so much more immersed in the world and the filmmaking and the characters once the finished product is delivered than the actors are who are off to the next job. So I can totally understand why there is that sort of like um, loving confusion about the kind of the disconnect between the performer and then the response, especially this many decades later. Uh, absolutely. I could totally understand the dissonance there. It, it, it conventions really are bonkers when you spell it out. Like it's a bunch of people from around the world. Wales was Nancy's example, but, you know, England, Canada, and your example, we met in Las Vegas. We traveled to, you know, me to a different continent to see people from a TV show. Like, what is that? What does that mean? Mm-hmm. Why do people do that? I, I think I tried to explain it in my own words a little bit. I think I was maybe sort of close to the mark for how I per- perceive it all. But I think it's um, it's testament to, I think, fandom in general, really, that a lot of people were keeping these projects alive through their passion. Even things like, you know, Jason and the Argonauts, people are rediscovering that from going back and looking at Harryhausen's work 
mm-hmm. and they'll that's how they'll find that film and they'll discover nancy for the first time or like even people who are spy movie fans like you and i and all of the listeners here uh, you know are discovering these films as we tackle them on the show that might have been your first experience of, of nancy kovac when we tackled the silences last year and now we're we're talking to her and i think we're we're keeping that sort of legacy alive of these films that to some people could you know as nancy saying she was an actor she did the job the film went out the tv show went out and that was it she moved on we're keeping the torch lit for stuff like matt helm because we're still talking about it yeah and matt helm is definitely one of those franchises that um has become a little obscure but we've been really excited stumbling across these movies and finding their weird energy very refreshing in contrast to the other stuff of that era we are you know covering on the show so it's been an absolute blast to kind of tumble down the rabbit hole that is the Matt Helm universe but fascinating to me that Nancy was not aware there was any sequels like Mm -hmm. that's how much she was working that when you're working that much in that period of time and again people look at her 60s on IMDb it's incredible um not a lot of free time to be running out to the theater and to be kind of following the zeitgeist of what's popular at the time like probably as you probably heard in the interview not fully aware of the spy craze going on in the 60s that came due to the James Bond success. Again, when you are working every day, pretty tough to follow these things. Ask anyone also who is like a uh, new parent, what's going on in current film or TV? They'll just give you like a blank stare. Cam is talking as a professional, of course, because he has (laughs) multiple kids. I have friends who have two kids and uh, they have absolutely no idea what's going on past like, (laughs) you know, a couple months into the pregnancy. They're like, how I met your mother stopped? Yeah. What? That show ended? Is Cheers still on? <laughs> Friends is, is over? What? <laughs> MASH? Where did that go? Yeah. Oh, that's a good show. Well, the only other thing I wanted to bring up in terms of sort of highlights of the chat, the entire chat was a highlight for me overall, but is just the candid sort of attitude Nancy had to her career. It actually took me back a little bit to our chat with Wendell Wellman a couple of years ago. And that was, again, a very impactful, candid discussion about Hollywood mm. and what it can do to a person. And it's too many, it's maybe we didn't go as in-depth in sort of the personal relationship to it. But Nancy said, you know, there was, she felt she had more in her and, and more uh, range to do different parts. But she was very much pigeonholed in her career. Mm-hmm. And she had a fun. Now she's living a wonderful life in Italy. And uh, frankly, I'm jealous of, of where she's living. But... That's something that will sort of stick under her craw, I think, for the rest of her days. You know, she had more in her, and it's clearly something that is a a small bug bear that she carries. And I appreciate she felt comfortable to discuss that with us. Yeah, and I mean, she was an Emmy nominee for her episode of Mannix. She did at the tail end of the '60s. It's someone who, as she said, you know, like got pigeonholed in a lot of very similar types of roles. But I do think that there is a certain diversity among those performances. Like, what you're doing on Batman 66 isn't really the same thing as, like, you know, say, even, like, Bewitched, Mm -hmm. and then jump over to doing things like, um, you know, Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I watched um, Frankie and Johnny, the Elvis film, uh, in preparation for this, just to get a feel of of things that she was doing around the time. And, And just for reference... That came out in 1966, as well as The Silences, as well as her two episodes of Batman, her two episodes of Perry Mason's, her one episode of The Double Life of Henry Fife, uh, and also one episode of The Wackiest Ship in the Army. Oh, and sorry, and an episode of The Man from Uncle, all in the same year, the, the famous 1960 sex that we like taking the mickey out of from <laughs> time to time. A busy year for Nancy. And you know, a very, very different role to the one she played in The Silences. Now, obviously, a much more brief role, but even the Star Trek role she played, again, very different to the character of Nancy Bly that she played in, in Frankie and Johnny, which is very much of a mysterious woman who is, I mean, you know, it's all very, it's said in like olden times with a steamboat casino and stuff like that. I think you probably enjoyed the film. But yeah, she had a lot of range. I just think Hollywood at that time wasn't ready to explore further options. Yeah. No, I mean, it's interesting she mentions Sally Field and really admiring her work. You look at like what the 70s was offering in terms of more grounded character roles and things like that. Um, You look at Anne Margaret, who we've talked about, who was in the second Matt Helm film. And you look at her 60s work, which is like really kind of really fun and energetic the way it is in Murderer's Row. 
and then you see her in like carnal knowledge in the 70s and it is just a raw like stripped down performance that's unbelievable it would have been really cool to see nancy given an opportunity like that but i can understand why she looks at those kind of 70s actors and is um somewhat um well wishes that that had been a road she'd been able to travel yeah, an opportunity she, that she could have had potentially. So, but I think overall, I think it was a a great discussion, a, a great get. I'm glad we had Nancy on, sort of give her story on the events around the silences. And it's it's interesting looking back on our our four films of Matt Helm. I'm sure we'll probably do a sort of round table on Matt Helm at some point. So I don't think this will be our last time talking about Dean Martin's uh, 60s Spy. But I, I've had a great time, sort of chronicling the four films and i hope this is serves as a nice little treat at the end yeah yeah for sure um but there you go folks that was our chat with nancy kovac and that was our last for now discussion about mr matt helm cam the question goes to you sir what have we got coming up next week yes we are looking at the 1993 david cronenberg film M butterfly <laughs> definite switch of pace here folks but i think it's gonna be a really interesting discussion yeah, I've been doing a little bit of research ahead of time on this one. Uh, it looks to be quite the fascinating film from things like the director, uh, all combined. I think there'll be a lot to talk about on this episode. So if you haven't seen M. Butterfly, your mission should you choose to accept it is to, of course, watch M. Butterfly and join us next week on the show. If you like what you heard, please consider leaving us a five-star review wherever you're listening to this show. And do not forget to follow us discreetly on social media at SpyHards, that's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, I am going to try and find myself a villa in Tuscany. Thank you.